so we were able to turn up the buck that we bedded last night. He's still with his group of six or seven does. Got it posted up about 700 yards downhill. He bedded again. So I came in solo for this stock. I've closed the distance till about 350. They're just kind of starting to get up and walk around. So I'm gonna try and stay in a wash and see if I can drop in on them from above. I guess we'll consider that the warm-up stock. I got to about 350, and I dipped into that last wash. And when I came out, I couldn't see him, so I don't know. Also, the closer I got to the toe of this hill, the thermals really picked up, and it was the wind basically went the opposite direction it was going on my way in, so I'm pretty sure. As soon as I hit that wash, the wind just blew my scent right up to them. Now, the nice thing is, I don't think I blew them out hard. I think they just moved on, but I'll check in with Hayden when I get down to the bottom here because he was, he had them in the spotter while I was making my stock. So he'll be able to give me some more intel as to what exactly happened. So anyways, time to go find some more deer. We're halfway through day two, so I figure it's time I actually introduce the film. So we're down here in New Mexico. I drew an archery mule deer tag for their late archery season, which is January 1st to 15th. Yes, sir. This is Hayden, by the way. Uh, Hayden's a local, lives near the unit that I drew, and a mutual friend put us in touch, and he offered to come out and, uh, and give me a hand. So I'm trying to think. It's been a crazy trip. I actually got stuck for two hours on the highway in Albuquerque in a blizzard when I landed, which kind of gave a late start to everything. But I was scouting by myself solo in the morning and then we got together yesterday afternoon. We turned up that buck mm -hmm. kind of end of the day yesterday. Yes, sir. And then kind of bedded him, came back out this morning and then you guys kind of saw what happened but basically this is like a heavily roaded unit so not you know no crazy backcountry stuff and what we're basically going to do is kind of bounce around to a couple known spots do some glassing and see if we can't turn up another buck and then if we can't this guy hopefully will settle down a bit from getting bumped this morning and maybe we'll come back in here this afternoon and see if we can't we can't turn him up but yeah that's the deal so let's go find some more deer So here's the deal. We came back to the spot where we were this morning and we were able to turn the same buck up again. He's bedded with some does. The problem is this hillside is just, just flat and open and he can see for miles. And I hummed and hawed and I was just about to go make another play on him. And, but like, not optimistically, but just cause I think, you know, it's worth it. And then Hayden came over and said, we could go look at, let another spot. So I think what we're gonna do is leave this buck here for now. We know he's here and we just need some type of advantage. Like I need him to bed behind a boulder or near a draw or just like something or even closer down towards the toe of the slope. Cause I think I can get across the flat okay. It's just as soon as I break out of the brush on the flats, I'm gonna be wide open, so. We're going to bounce and we're going to go check a new spot. All right, so we had a little change of plans. Uh, Hayden has a Barbary tag or Audad tag. I'm used to calling them Audads, but in New Mexico, you call them Barbary sheep. So he has a, a, an Audad tag for the same unit and he was good enough to give the weekend to kind of help show me around. But when we didn't go after that last buck, he's like, you know, if you wouldn't mind, we could spend a couple hours and go look for some sheep. I said, yeah, of course, man. So we came over here instantly, found a big herd of sheep. 
Um, he dumped off up the hill to go chase him. Everything was looking good. And then you'll see from the phone scope footage, I think he bumped two does on his way up the ridge. Here, I'll show you exactly what happened. So he was walking up here. The sheep were here. The sheep were originally headed this way and he was going this, this way, but then some deer went this way. The sheep got spooked and sprinted over, basically sprinted over the back side of the ridge. Now they were only walking when it, they went over the back side. So he's still gonna make the play and see if there's anything he can do. Um, and I'm just gonna keep glass in the front of this and if they, if they pour back over onto this side, I'll let them know. Well, folks, as usual, this thing's turning into a bit of a grind. So we're currently on the morning of day four. So I have all day today and I still have six more hunt days after this. So it's not like I don't have time. I'm trying not to stress out, but it has not been an overly productive hunt. I've seen two bucks since I got here. One was like a 130 inch three by four. Uh, the other was the most giant framed two by two I've ever seen in my life. Um, super cool buck, but literally just caught a flash of him as we drove by him on the road and we tried to go back and he was gone. I've driven, I don't even know how many hundreds of miles since I got here and glassed up. I don't know how much country. Uh, part of it, the weather has definitely influenced, you know, the lack of success. Uh, Last night, it blew about 60 miles an hour all night. It was absolutely insane. Woke up this morning to the forecast with uh, 75 mile an hour gusts and 60 mile an hour winds all day. I'm in this like tiny little nook on the back side of a peak and somehow it's relatively reasonable. But as soon as I go 10 feet that way or 10 feet that way, it's like hurricane level winds. And I just can't see deer walking around in this. So I'm gonna sit and I'm gonna glass because I'd rather be productive than not. And I'm trying to look down into all the washes because I think if they're anywhere today, that's where they're gonna be. Winds are supposed to die down for tomorrow and Wednesday and then pick back up Thursday. So um, that's, you know, a little bit of good news. But yeah, um, back by myself, Hayden only had the weekend. He might be able to sneak out in some afternoons and come give me a hand, but I'm, I'm by myself for the rest of the trip now. So we'll see how things go. 
Just gotta keep giving her. You know, I was talking to Hayden about this and I think a lot of success just comes from not stopping. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but I think a lot of the shit that I've killed is just because I just kept walking around, just looking. I mean, even if it's windy today, I'm not gonna sit in camp. I mean, if all I do is walk around washes and still hunt, you know, the bottoms of all these cuts, I mean, at least that's something. You just never know when something can pop up. So I'm gonna keep my head up, I'm gonna try and stay optimistic, and hopefully we'll turn up a buck. Let me see if I can adequately explain what it's like being in my head for a day on a hunt like this. So crazy morning because of the wind and everything else, but overall the kind of driving thought this morning was that this is the kind of hunt where if you don't love hunting, you're going to hate it because you're not seeing tons of animals. You're not going on a crazy adventure, like you're, you're driving around roads, like it doesn't have that, that sense of excitement that some hunts do. And there's not, you know, like I said, big animals running around everywhere to, to create excitement in another way. And it's like, if you don't love the act of hunting, the glassing, the hiking, you know, the strategy, you're gonna hate a hunt like this. And I was pretty content in that, you know, I was, I was loving it. And this phrase from Gary V, and I know he can be a bit much sometimes, but he does have some good tidbits, came into my head. Everybody is urgent for the outcome, but no one is urgent for the work it takes to achieve it. And I always try to remind myself of that when I'm hunting, because I tend to get caught up in the kill. I mean, the kill's the fun part. That's the part everybody loves. It's the other shit that leads up to the kill that's hard and challenging um, and a whole bunch of other adjectives that are somewhat unpleasant. Um, and I was in it, you know? I was like, yeah, I'm urgent for the work and yeah, I love it. But now that I'm sitting here, it's like 4.30 in the afternoon. I think it's like 25 Fahrenheit out right now. The wind is just starting to die down. And like, if you asked me if I love it, and if you asked me if I'm urgent for the work, if I'm completely honest with you, I mean, the answer is no. I hate failing. And I wish I could tell you that while I'm on one of these hunts, I was always sure of the outcome. And I, you know, I felt positive that I was always doing the right thing. But it is literally like a minute to minute battle against doubt. What am I actually here for? Am I here to just kill an animal? Or am I here to do a certain thing in a certain way? And there's something like greater to be achieved by doing that certain thing in a certain way. So at the end of the day, I don't know what the answer is. But I know that something feels different about adhering to the struggle and not looking for an easy way out. Even if that means the lack of success, like there's something greater to be gained as an individual, as a man, from fighting that fight. Even if you lose the fight, 
you know? back at it for day five. So I hiked into this spot this morning. I've been glassing for the last three hours. I think it's about 9.30 now. I was able to turn up two does, a pair of them like together. And I kept checking back on them and then a buck never showed up. They just kind of meandered out of this little drainage that I'm in right now. And I absolutely, you know, picked every square inch apart of this rest of this hillside and I didn't see anything. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go on a hike. Um, and I'm actually gonna walk the ridge line of the faces that I just glassed and kind of look over into the next drainage behind the one that I'm just looking at. Um, probably take another few hours to go do that hike. It'll carry me through till lunch and then I'll come up with another plan for the afternoon if I don't see anything particularly interesting back there. I'm trying to tuck out of the wind here so you can actually hear me. Hiked into the second glassing spot. Actually got a really good vantage point. Spent another couple hours just absolutely picking this place apart and yet again found nothing. Starting to get a bit frustrated. But I don't know man, just gotta keep on keeping on. So I'm gonna hike out of here, go grab some lunch and then make a game plan for the afternoon. All right, so Hayden was able to sneak out for the afternoon. We came over to it to a new area and we were just having a conversation about does. So what, how long have we been? We've been glassing for probably two hours yeah. and seen first group we saw six, second group we saw six, so that's 12. And then there was this, the single. And then the single, so that's 13, 13. plus two more out here. So that's 15, 15. does. And no buck with them. Yeah, which is, which is odd. Yes, like I think yeah. that's odd. Correct. Yeah, it, it's really odd. There should be, they should be um, rutting right now. Now, one thing, it is still windy as hell. Now, do you think, like the does are up and about, but do you think that changes the buck behavior? I don't think so. They should all be up there. Yeah, they should all be up, just feeding like all these does are. It's three o'clock now yeah four o'clock it's prime time right now they should be up and feeding the other thing is that we're in really open country and one thing i find about mule deer when it's they're really open country what they're using to kind of protect themselves is the fact that they're going to see you from a really long ways away so they also i find don't tend to hide as much where no, when you're in they're... canyon country they tend to hide more because you could sneak up on them yeah, yeah for sure all the does we've seen are out in the open I mean, there's a little bit of cover that you could get. Like these, you could go up this bottom and they peek over the top and you could probably kill them. But other than that, they've been all open country stuff. So the other thing I think that is challenging about out here, other than the wind, is just how open it is too. But there are lots of like little coolies and draws. And I do feel like if we spotted a buck, like it's, it's challenging, but you could make a play. Yeah, we're definitely in killable spots. That's why we're on the top, so you can glass all the draws. And they usually hang out in the draws and stuff, you'd think. Yeah. And they should be bedded up, like, in the like the shady draw right here. They should be bedded up all day, and then they get up right about now, go feed, and then be good for the rest of the night. And then we'll find another spot in bed where they'll bed up against a rock cliff or something. 
So anyways, that's the game plan for the rest of the day. It's not like super exciting, but just trying to cover as much country as we can. Bro. Bro. <laughs> what happened? I think my bow's off. Think so? Way that way. Like way in the other way, the wind's not even blowing. Yeah. 38 yards. 38? Fucking. That's a slam dunk for you, man. That's what I thought. So oh I my, my God. Off. So we're gonna shoot it real quick. Okay. Yeah, the target's in the back. What we actually just figured out was Hayden's rangefinder because you came down and you thought your bow might have been out. I thought my bow was off, yeah. So we grabbed the target, mm -hmm. you shot the target three times, yep. you're bang on the money. Yeah, on the money, right in the white. But then we talked about the, um, the cut slope, like compensating for angle, angle and yeah. you did a little bit of math in your head, but kind of thought your rangefinder. I think my rangefinder's off because I ranged them at 38.6. Like yeah. And they looked a little closer. Yeah. And so <coughs> I think ultimately, it's also crazy windy out here. Like it was a, it was a very challenging shot. Like it was, it was very like steep. Five, six mile an hour wind. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. intense. So I think, I think the, the, the fact that the rangefinder wasn't compensating for angle uh -huh. is a big because if it would have Not been... Not saying it's an excuse, but that's a good reason. It certainly contributed, yeah. yeah. And it's a good takeaway, too. But Hayden said something else that was interesting, that he was glad he at least went on the stock. And I think sometimes... I mean, there's always stuff to be learned from the stock, but that... You could almost talk yourself out of that stock. Because oh, they yeah. saw us down at the truck, and you would think, oh, they're not just going to hang out, you know? No, they definitely wouldn't. Like, I told myself, you miss 99% of the shots you don't take. Yeah. If I wouldn't take that shot, I wouldn't have hit him if I even tried. Totally. So, so what, walk us through what happened, because I filmed you walking up, and you kind of yeah. thought they were further back across. So, when we first drove up on them, they were probably, what did I say, like 130 yards? Yeah. So, I was thinking they are about 130 yards, which I can only shoot out to 90. Yeah. So, I got up there and was trying to work my way through the trees and catch them going over the top. And the case was they were probably 20, 30 yards off the top. So I got to I got to a tree, kept looking, it was too thick, couldn't see them. Then popped out and saw a U walk in between two trees and ranged her and she was 38. And I was like, well, here's my shot. Might as well, drew back, set my 40 pin in, anchored and hit high and uh, left. I just skimmed her back. So then I tried to go up over the top and caught him on the backside in the shade. Uh, I had them at 114, 130, and then they started going because they saw me as kind of open back there. Yeah, yeah. So, well, uh, at least we got some action today. <laughs> oh yeah, a little better sure. than just walking around doing nothing. Oh yeah. So we still got a little bit of daylight left. We're gonna keep cruising this road system here. Maybe we see some deer. Maybe we see some more odd dad. Who knows? But tough break, man.
failed stock of the day so we came right back out to where we saw him last night and I picked him up right away with his doe and made a little stock but I just got to where he was and there's there's no sign of him I'm gonna hike back to the truck and see if Hayden was able to keep eyes on him or not all right so I'm back from that stock Hayden didn't see where he went but the wash that he was on the other side of is pretty deep so he could have went either way however the fact that Hayden didn't see him I think is a good thing because it means he didn't like burst out or blow out hard because he would have seen him running across this kind of open grassland for sure um, the other good news is this deer is only about 500 yards from where we saw him last night so I think as long as we don't do anything too aggressive we should be able to, to pick him back up at some point here in the near future. So we're just gonna hang out, try and catch a little bit of elevation and uh, see if we can pick him back up. All right, so we picked up another buck, had a little walk to a little knoll, glassed him for maybe like 20, 25 minutes. Wind is coming real strong in a predominant direction. So we're gonna loop back around and get behind him and up on top. He's not the biggest buck in the world, but he's decently wide and he looks nice and mature. He's with, what do you think, like six or seven does? Uh, like five, yeah. Five, yeah. Five's a good number. I so, think I counted five or six. I think. I think we got a chance to make a good stock, so fingers crossed. Just got back from failed stock number two. Now, everything went perfect from our perspective, but somewhere between the first glassing location and the second glassing location, we lost sight of the buck, but we had sight of the does. So we made a game plan. We were at 950. I got all the way to about 250. We were doing hand signals. Hayden indicated I need to move my line uphill. So I went uphill. And then I belly crawled for about 75, got behind a big yucca, and then peaked. Uh, actually, I saw the does before that, but I got over a fence, got behind a big yucca, picked, peaked up, and I had the does dead to rights at 128. They didn't know I was there. The wind is howling. Like, what do you think? Is it 40? It's got to be 40 miles an hour. Yeah, 35, 40. 35, 40. Like, it's crazy. Like, it, my ears are ringing right now. Like, it just beats it's the blown. shit out of you. Wow. You're up there. So what happened from, from your perspective? So I was sitting on the knob back there, got up, watched the does feed over behind the little like end of the goalie, and then watched you creep over, and that's the last time I saw them. Yeah. So I don't know where they went. They kind of just went back behind, kind of cut up. I figured they would come over the top, though, because of the wind. Yeah, we're, I, I watched them disappear over the top and down into a little crevice. So I don't know, we're gonna go back to the original, is that what we wanna do, go back to the yeah. original glassing point and see if we can pick that buck back up? And if that doesn't back work, up. then find a new deer. Yeah, we'll just keep cruising uh -huh. down this system and see if we can turn something else up. They seem to be moving today, that's for sure. So I don't know. The fact that we got two stocks in before 10 o'clock in the morning though, like this is what I've been waiting for this whole trip. Like this is all you can really ask for as a bow hunter, is the opportunity to put a stock on a deer. And that went, 
as good as can possibly be expected. The hard part about this country is that kind of, even in the best case scenario, you're going to lose sight of your buck for a while. So there's always this risk that when you come out where you want to come out, they've moved and you don't know when they moved or where they went. And it's just part of the game. Like you've just got to keep putting on stocks and eventually one of them comes together. Third and final blown stock of the day. Did a bit of a Hail Mary, about a kilometer from the truck. I think you can see the lights way off in the distance. Basically, we picked up the same buck from this morning one more time and he disappeared into this cut. And I knew it was a super low percentage play, but there was maybe half an hour of daylight left. So I figured, what the hell, grab the bow, sprint across the field and you know it's one of those things where I just needed two percent more luck unbelievably enough I was able to make my way all the way over here get behind the cut didn't get detected didn't see a deer the whole way over here finally picked them back up I was 400 yards away then there was another little ridge between me and and uh, deer, 150 for me. So I closed that gap, I got to 250. He was rutting the does hard, pushing them all around. And then uh, they kind of went up and over this rise. And I thought, well, if they stop on the other side of that rise, I've got a chance. So I made a break for it, popped up over the rise and they were just gone, man. Kind of caught their asses as they disappeared two or three ridges over. So I don't know if they smelt me, I don't know if it's just rutting behavior, but oh, I tried, man, I tried. I'm uh, a little beat up, so need some food and sleep. Still got four more days. It's an eternity, lots of time. All right, folks, it is the morning of day seven and we're already getting our ass kicked. Uh, it is currently blowing 40 miles an hour with predicted gusts up to 70. I'm gonna give you a little look at what's going on outside. You can literally feel the truck, you know, bouncing from side to side. It is hard not to get depressed. Like day after day, I just keep getting my ass handed to me, but I'm gonna remain upbeat. Um, I'm out, I'm hunting, I can't ask for a whole lot else. Um, I'm in a new spot this morning, I'm by myself. You know, at the very least, we'll, we'll scout some country. Glassing in this wind has actually proven to be very challenging, like you can't even hold your glass still, like it's just like shaking like this. And I hate seeming like I'm complaining. It's not that I'm trying to whine, I'm just trying to give an accurate portrayal of what it's actually like down here. Um, and it's tough, but whatever. Gonna keep my head up. Gonna try and, again, the theme here, cover as much country as possible, glass as much country as possible. There's supposed to be some javelina out here this way, and you can buy an over-the-counter javelina tag. Um, 
in the month of January in this particular unit in New Mexico. So who knows, man? Maybe if I see some stink pigs running around, I'll bomb over, get a tag, and, and come back and try and put an arrow in one of those. That'd be a fun thing to do today. And I don't think the wind bothers them nearly as much because they're so much lower. Um, yeah, so that's the game plan. Let's cover some ground, find some deer, maybe a pig. This is failed stock number five. So here's the deal. I'm gonna try and supplement this with some of the GoPro footage and phone footage and Onyx information. So maybe this will make more sense if I put some of that stuff in here. But basically I looped all the way around behind those deer. I came up over the ridge. I saw them the first time at 260 yards. All right, I got to within 270 and they're feeding inside of a cut. So I'm gonna back out and try another angle. I think I can get into under 100. So here we go. I'm like, okay, I got no line here. I got no cover. I backed out, looped around to another spot, came back over, and unfortunately what happened was they fed down into a cut, and then instead of continuing in the same direction and coming up towards me, they turned around and started feeding back up on the same side of the cut they just came down. So when I came over the far ridge, I actually caught them as they were coming back up out of the ridge. I got behind like a dead yucca and I ranged them and I ranged the buck at 105 yards. And I mean, it's blown like 60 up there. Not that I would ever take a hundred yard shot anyways, but it was like, there's no way anything over Realistically, with this wind, 40 is pushing it. So I sat there and it looked at first, like based on their body language and their way they were moving, I couldn't tell if they were gonna go up the hill, come back down the hill, go around the front of the hill. So I just sat and waited. I must have waited. I was gone for an hour and a half. I was gone for almost two hours. Two hours, yeah. I was gone for two hours. So let's say it took me 15 minutes to stalk in another 10 minutes to walk back. I was sitting behind that yucca stone still for an hour and a half. And the sons of bitches just fed straight across the hill. And I'm sitting there, bro. I can't believe they never busted me, but I really? guess because I never moved, yeah, no. there was nothing to, to bust. And I would look at them with the binos. I would range them. And because the two sides of the hill were completely parallel, there wasn't even like a you know, sometimes the way a hill rounds, you can like get behind it and sneak up on it from the side. Also, I couldn't get on their side of the cut because that's the way the wind was blowing. So as soon as I got on their side, they were going to win me. And then I thought they were going to go up and over back to the same side we saw them on the first time. If they'd have done that, I had a play because they would have gone out of sight and I could have just sprinted across mm -hmm. the cut and come up on top of them. And I was praying and praying and praying, and I know I'm running out of daylight. Finally, they're not going up and over. Basically, what they're going to do is go back to, like, where the two cuts kind of meet. And if they go in there, I literally have nothing. Because the tops of the hills are all so far from there, and there's no cover, I'm literally screwed. So at that point, I think they're far enough over the edge that I should be able to back out and come up the bottom of the cut and kinda, and it was a risky play, but after sitting there for an hour and a half and recognizing that the direction that they were going wasn't gonna leave me with a play anyways, I decided to risk it. So I got up and I kinda crouched my way maybe 30 yards, and then I, I looked behind me and the deer were looking right at me. But I didn't know if they were gonna blow out. I kept walking. I made the stalk as if they didn't blow out. By the time I got to where they were, there's no sign of any deer anywhere. So I literally have no idea where they went. So 105 yards, that's the closest yet. Yeah, man, tough country. And there we go, another failed stock. Well, apparently we got one kind of luck and we got lots of it.
Guess I know what I'm doing tomorrow morning. Well, we're basically at the end of the day for Friday and I just needed to get myself a little bit of credit. We were on the way out and we saw a little dink buck. We're, our, we're, we can't decide, he's somewhere between 100 and 110. Like just a little spindly buck. But he stayed put and I actually got out of the truck, came back to full draw. He was standing broadside at 40, settled my pin on him. I sat there for a second or two and I just knew this is not the buck, it's not right. Like, and I do think it's important that you you get to a point in your hunting career when it's not, you know, killing the right thing is more important than just killing. And so, little buck gets passed today and hopefully we can turn up something else. You know, we got two full days left of hunting, so she ain't over until the fat lady sings. Right, folks it's the last morning and Hayden gets upset when I don't do an intro so I'm doing an intro um, we're back in an area we've been I don't know two three times over the last three or four days we do not have a fantastic game plan for today but we got a bunch of different areas to check out and yeah we're just gonna grind it out we turned up zero bucks yesterday one tiny little spike which doesn't even count as a buck. It was like a, yeah. A still on the milk. Yeah, still on the milk. Anyways, so that's the game plan. Just keep grinding. Hopefully we can turn up a buck today and put a good stock on them. So we turned up some sheep. The stock looks challenging to say the least. So we're gonna go for a little hike over this ridge and see, see if it's even possible. And at that point we'll reassess and, and maybe young Hayden here will we'll head out on another stock. All right, so we went for a little hike and the odd dad where they're sitting now are not really playable. 
There's like one hyper low percentage play we could theoretically make, but we decided to let him sit. Now we're just trying to decide what to do with the rest of the day. So we're gonna drive kind of back out to the front of this system where there's this one kind of flats area. We've seen a couple bucks on a regular basis and we're gonna go glass that for a bit and then decide what to do with the rest of the day. All right, folks, we're back for the afternoon push and I am solo, empty seat. So we found those sheep for Hayden. Hayden's only got two days left on his sheep tag. I think it's important that he has that time to dedicate to sheep hunting. So we decided to rip back. He picked up his truck. He's kind of one road system over for me right now and he's almost back sitting on his sheep. So I got my fingers crossed that um, he's gonna be able to get it done this afternoon. And even if he's not, he can put those sheep to bed tonight and he'll know where they're at tomorrow morning. So. I'm going to close out my last day here in New Mexico solo. We've definitely seen deer in here before. I just spotted a doe 100 yards off the road over there. So far today, we've seen 31 deer in total uh, with two both very marginal bucks, which is kind of the story of this unit, to be honest with you. But um, still got half a day, just finished my lunch. Spirits are high. Let's go find a buck. made one last valiant attempt but was not successful I was coming out along the last stretch and exactly where I made that play on that buck the other night where I sat in the wind for an hour and a half I watched a buck and a doe cross the road in front of me like 200 yards so I, I drove up I drove past I saw the the buck pushing the doe up and over the hill and so I took a point on their last location and I just literally grabbed the GoPro and my bow and sprinted off up the hill. And it was, it was just getting too dark and I got over there and, and I couldn't turn them up. And that buck was pushing that doe pretty hard. And I think they just kept going over other ridges. So, I mean, that is the definition. It literally, it got so dark on my way back, I could barely make it to the truck. So I can say with 100% confidence that I gave it everything I had from the crack of light of day one until the sun set on day 10. And some days that's all you can do. So the hunt ended yesterday. So I've had a good night's sleep and a couple hundred miles driving to kind of simmer on things. So what did I, what did I think about this hunt? What was my reaction to it? How do I feel about it, you know, as it's wrapped up? Well, I feel like it's a bit of a dichotomy. Like this was a terrible hunt and a phenomenal hunt at the exact same time. Like I feel like those two things can be true at the same time. Why was it a terrible hunt? The weather was atrocious, literally 40 to 60 mile per hour winds every single day. It was cold. There was a blizzard when I landed. Um, I don't think the rut had really kicked off. Like a whole lot that was out of my control was far less than ideal. Now, why was it a phenomenal hunt? Because I got to test myself. And I think that that's a huge reason why I do this stuff and there was some interesting aspects to those tests on this hunt that's different than most of my other hunts and I'm gonna get into that I scoured the earth man I don't think 
Uh, I was gonna say, I don't think I've ever glassed this much. I mean, I've had a lot of hunts where I glassed a lot, but they were also broken up by like days where you just hiked. And not only that, the type of glassing that you do, like when you glass in BC or you glass in some of these other more like traditionally mountainous forested regions, even when you're looking at the landscape, there's maybe like 20 to 40% of it that you could find an animal in. The rest is either too heavily timbered or bare rock or, or canyons or the, 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 the terrain just doesn't present the opportunity for there to be animals there so you don't have to worry about it. So when you're looking out at the vast landscape, there's only a percentage of it that you actually have to concern yourself with. Down here, man, every square inch needs to be examined. There could be a deer anywhere and there's no trees for them to hide behind. There's like little valleys and there's terrain features that obviously create cover. But if you can see it, you need to glass it and you need to glass it with intention. And I think it requires a whole different level of focus. And to do that for 10 days straight from the moment the sun came up until the moment the sun went down, yeah, I was thinking about it. And the only way I can describe it is that we scoured the earth. And I gotta give Hayden some credit for hanging out with me and helping me, you know, as much as he did on this hunt. He didn't have to do that. And that meant a whole lot to me. Now, I talked earlier about some of the tests being different on this hunt. And I wanna share a story. I got a call from my daughter and my wife on maybe like day four or five. My daughter was having a meltdown. I won't get into why. But to her, something very important was not right. And she was having troubles dealing with it. And I was trying to explain to her that lots of times in life, there are things that are not in our control that go a way we don't want them to. And then a lot of who we are as a human being is defined by how we deal with those situations. And here's the deal, I don't like these heavily roaded hunts. If I'd spent more time e-scouting this unit before applying to it, I wouldn't have applied here. The same thing kind of happened to me in Colorado. And lesson learned, man. I, I like challenging hunts, but I realized I like my version of challenging. And this was a version of challenging I don't like but I had no choice about it. So that allowed me to kind of test myself in a new way. Not only was it challenging, it was a challenging I didn't want to participate in, but I had no choice about it. The most efficient and effective way possible, not the way you want to. Don't turn an elk hunt into a backcountry hunt if it's not meant to be. If it's a bivy unit, bivy hunt it. If it's a truck unit, truck hunt it. And that's what I had to learn in this unit. It was a truck unit and I had to hunt it that way. And it's not my, you know, preferred method of, of hunting, but it didn't give me an excuse to hunt it any less hard. Now, all that being said, I've thought a lot about it and I had two big wins on this hunt. Uh, the first one is, I forget what night it was, maybe the night of day seven, right before sunset, I came to full draw on a decent little buck and let down. Now I say all the time that we're supposed to get to a place as hunters where we only target mature animals because the adversary we choose should be a worthy one. And for me at this point, shooting smaller bucks is not something I wanna do. Now when I went to Colorado, I also wanted to target a more mature animal, but I was having all these really close encounters and I kind of made the decision that no matter what I saw, if it was legal, I was gonna pull the trigger because the time that I had been taking to make up my mind was causing me to lose shot opportunities. And the buck that I shot was not an overly mature animal. I'm still proud of that buck. However, it was a lesson to me that if I want to hold out for a truly mature animal, that's going to mean losing shot opportunities. So while I've seen smaller bucks in the glass and decided not to pursue them, I've never been in a situation where I literally could have let an arrow fly on a smaller animal and decided not to. So when I came back to full draw, settled my pin, buck was perfectly broadside, and I just sat there, thought about it, and said, nope, let down. Walked back to the truck, got in, drove away, buck walked away. 
that was what the first true test I think I've had where I let a less than mature animal walk away that I could have killed. And that was a big win for me. And the second big win was on the, uh, the night that I stalked in, I think it was the night uh, of day eight, I got into 105 yards on that mature three by four and sat there for probably close to two hours. And just due to the wind and the topography, I couldn't close the distance. But that's the longest that I've been that close to a mature buck. And I think that really says something about where I've got my stalking skills to that I could get in there and hold that close. And that, I just needed one tiny break. The three or four different escape routes they could have taken to get out of that little cut, any one of them would have provided me with a shot opportunity except the one that they took. And I also prided myself on the fact that I had the patience to wait because they could have changed direction at, at any time. Unfortunately, I ran out of daylight and I just didn't get a shot opportunity and it is what it is. But those two wins for me, letting down on a less than mature buck and stalking into 105 on a nice big mature desert muley and, and, and sitting there for close to two hours and not getting detected by a buck with 11 does, big wins for me. Now, Here's the final takeaway. I've always been this adventure hunt guy. I like going places, I like seeing new terrain. The funny thing is, the longer I hunt, the more excited I get about the stuff closer to home. And it's because I've realized the hunt is more than just the hunt, if that makes sense. Like it's, it's more than just the seven days or the 10 days or the 12 days that you're hunting. And I have these hunts planned at home this year that are gonna take months of prep. You know, I've got cameras sitting for mule deer that I've had up since last year. I've got bait plans for whitetail that I'm gonna be driving up in April and will probably visit five or six times before the fall. I have all this work that I'm gonna be putting in to build up this knowledge around these animals at home so that when it comes time for the hunt, I'm not just showing up blind and being forced to figure everything out in a week or two. I'm gonna have pre-existing knowledge and I'm actually more excited about building that knowledge than I am about the hunts themselves. And I think that's a big shift in, in my career or my development as a hunter. Like I feel different about this year than I have about any other year. So I'm excited, I'm excited. And listen, you know, I got my ass kicked, but I woke up this morning and I'm like, I started thinking of ways that I could talk my wife into letting me go hunting next month. I'm like, I can find an open season somewhere for something, man. Like, I love chasing these animals and being out and just getting after it so much. And even when it beats me down and I'm depressed and I feel lonely and I feel overwhelmed and beaten, it's like one good night's sleep and a cup of coffee later, I'm like, let's dance, man. Let's just dance. So, another hunt concluded, no dead animal, but, Skills were honed, lessons were learned, and we're on to the next one. Thank you all for taking the time to watch.